So um, since we had such a nice introduction, I'm just going to jump into it. But I will say that Tom is a Pulitzer Prize winning finalist. And he wrote part of his book on campus in Elliott Hall. So we're all very proud of him. Um, so we did have a little bit of an um, introduction there. But can you tell us, just give us a brief summary of what this scandal was and what it meant for Malaysia and for the world? Yeah, first of all, I want to say it is great to be back here, uh, Keith. Um, I did write part of the book here. I wrote part of it in Indonesia and part of it in Elliott Hall. It was a fantastic, uh, quiet place over the summer without any students here. So thank you, Hong Kong University. Um, yes, the, OK, so this scandal, um, can I just have a quick show of hands about who's read the book? OK, and, and hands about who knows what this is about. OK, so we don't need to be too, I've, I've talked to audiences where nobody knows anything about it. So um, basically, this is a, a scandal. It, it's probably one of the world's largest financial scandals in the amount of money that this character, Jolo, had in his hands. Most pyramid schemes, like Bernie Madoff's, um, take decades to build up um, with small investors. In this case, Jolo literally had billions of dollars in his hands, li liquid cash. And that's why we're calling it one of the biggest, or if not the biggest, in terms of how much, of how much money he was able to move around. Um, the the scandal is important for a number of reasons, if we, if we give the 10,000-foot overview. One is that it shows uh, the, uh, the state of the global financial system in the 21st century. The fact that Jolo was able to do what he did was, was because of the enablers in the financial system from Wall Street banks to auditors to law firms to um, uh, ratings agencies. Everybody enabled him. Okay? On a very simple level, um, Joe Lowe used connections in the Malaysian government and elsewhere to take over a sovereign wealth fund. Sovereign wealth funds today manage more money than hedge funds and private equity funds combined. So they're incredibly powerful. A lot of the new sovereign wealth funds in the world are in poorly regulated emerging markets, including 1MDB, this fund that was set up in Malaysia. Um, Joe Lowe was able to persuade the Prime Minister of Malaysia to allow him to run the fund from behind the scenes. He, he promised Najib um, political financing. So it was a typical uh, emerging market political slush fund, right? But the crazy thing with this story was that it was, as I mentioned, it was enabled by the global financial system. 1MDB didn't have any money. They went onto global markets to raise it, with a, uh, to raise billions of dollars with the help of Goldman Sachs. And then Jolo uh, set up deals with other sovereign wealth funds in other places in the world, including in the Middle East. And they conspired to steal that money that they had raised on global markets. And at no point in the whole scandal Ran from 2000, is my mic still working? Yeah. Yes. Which ran from 2009 until 2015. Did any of the compliance officers at any of the banks or law firms or auditors involved in this ever call Jolo out on what was happening, or call anyone out on what was happening? So when the, the money was raised by Goldman and stolen, no one at Goldman knew. And we've had recent and news that Goldman were, some partners at Goldman were much more deeply involved in this than we, we knew. Auditors that audited the Sovereign Wealth Fund did not uh, catch what was going on. Private Swiss banks that helped move the money did not catch what was going on. And th so this is, this is sort of the, the most important theme of the book, is when everyone is making money in the global financial system, nobody does compliance, mm. and nobody catches it. Um, what did Jolo do with the money? So once he had stolen these, these uh, billions of dollars, what he really wanted to do was become a major player in Hollywood. And so he used the money to uh, become very close to Leonardo DiCaprio and to set up, from behind the scenes again, a Hollywood film company that went on to make The Wolf of Wall Street, um, the, the film The Wolf of Wall Street with Leonardo DiCaprio. So another big theme in the book is if you have enough money you can buy yourself into almost any, any room or any, any world. If you have enough uh, belief in yourself, like Jolo did, you can buy yourself into any. He bought himself into Leonardo DiCaprio's Inner Circle. He bought himself into the center of Hollywood. I think the book shows, for those of you who have read it, how 
corrupt Hollywood is and how easy it is to, with money just to get deeply into that world. Um, and then he, he even began to set himself up as a bona fide businessman with this stolen money. He bought major hotels in New York. He bought EMI Music Publishing. Um, he was going to buy um, a Reebok from Adidas. So he was, he was, and again, nobody ever asks questions about him. It was almost as if there was never any due diligence. Um, so those are the two sort of big themes of the book. And then on another level, it's a biography of Joe Lowe, who is this mm -hmm. extraordinary character, basically, this extraordinary man. He literally is the modern day Great Gatsby. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So two of the big themes that you just mentioned are greed and wealth and this spectacular desire for money and accumulation. Um, sort of less popular to do it in the US after the financial crisis, but it seems like in Asia, being extremely wealthy is as popular as ever. Can you talk about that or the desire for people like Jolo to have it all? You know? So Jolo's great, um, I don't know you call it a genius, but his insight is, was that, I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but money really does motivate everybody to a greater degree than we're probably willing to admit. And we tried not to be too, too judgmental in, our, in the way that we created this narrative. There are, there are characters in there, in the book, who are just like you or I, right? There's a guy called Seat Lin Lin. Jolo went, so we'll start at the beginning of Jolo's story. He's from Penang. <laughs> he, he's from a fairly wealthy family. His family are worth a few millions. His father is, is, is quite corrupt, right? He does corrupt deals in Penang. <laughs> uh, you, some Malaysians here, I guess, right? <laughs> um, you know, his father, for example, would fly, uh, would do these corrupt deals and then fly Swedish models in to Penang to party on boats. So that, this was how Jolo grew up, right? So he sort of, um, but he, um, he went to Wharton. And when he was at Wharton, he, f he started out as that kind of typical uh, broker you get in a lot of business deals in Asia. He figured out, he, would, he was always in a room figuring out who the most powerful people were. So when he was at Wharton, he didn't really care. He was, he was a bachelor's student of economics. He didn't really care for studying. He was fairly smart. But what he really cared about was getting to know the kids of the extremely rich people, including you know, uh, the Sultan of Brunei's kids um, and wealthy Persian Gulf uh, Emirati's kids. He took a semester off, and he um, persuaded uh, his friends to set him up on this tour of, of the Middle East, where he would then meet all these wealthy people. And he got to know the current uh, person who is now the current UAE ambassador to Washington, a guy called Yusuf Alotaiba. Alotaiba is an incredibly powerful ambassador in Washington. He, he was behind, he supported the Sunny Surge under the Bush administration. He's, he, uh, Susan Rice would go to him to get advice on the Middle East. He's behind the Qatar blockade recently. He was also secretly Jolo's enabler because Jolo had been set up with this guy. And Jolo figured out what Otaiba wanted. Otaiba was a powerful Middle Eastern ambassador and politician, an aide to politicians, but he wasn't particularly wealthy. So Jolo uh, started to get him involved in deals where Otaiba then became wealthy, and in return, Otaiba helped to get these Middle Eastern funds to invest in Malaysia. So that was the beginning of Jolo's uh, Bildungsroman, whatever you want to call it, right? He, he basically was able to show uh, politicians back in Malaysia, that he could bring this, these Middle Eastern investors in. So, so he sensed, uh, you talked about greed, he sensed what people wanted. You know, he sensed that Otaiba, this otherwise powerful guy, wanted, um, and in the book we have a chapter called A Nice Toy, which is where Otaiba and his business partner talk about buying a Ferrari after doing their first deal with Jolo, right? And so, you know, Otaiba is a very urbane, educated guy, but behind the scenes, he was motivated by money. He takes Wharton classmates to join. So, so he's a broker. He's make, Jolo's making money. He, he needs to build a team of people. At the beginning, his idea wasn't to steal billions, I don't think. It was just to do these broker deals and take his cut. Very, very typical thing in, in Asia, right? Um, he, uh, he brings in a classmate called Seat Lin Lin, who was a Wharton classmate. Very smart guy, Singaporean, on a scholarship from the Monetary Authority of Singapore to study at, at Wharton. And he brings him into his com to a com new company he sets up to do more deals. And you know, Seat Lin Lin, everyone said he was a family man, a nice guy, modest. Seat Lin Lin is now on the run, having helped Jolo through all of this 
this. So um, Jolo was always able to work out what somebody in the room wanted, right? Um, after, uh, so then he gets in with Najib Razak. Najib Razak at the time was the deputy prime minister of Malaysia who had this wife, um, Rosma Mansour, who's this Imelda Marcos-like figure or Marie Antoinette-like figure who loves jewels, loves good things, already a very corrupt couple by the time Jolo comes on the scene. Najib had been defense minister and got involved in all these, these dodgy defense deals. But Jolo sensed, again, what did Najib need? Okay, he wanted to be as rich as a Middle Eastern uh, royal family member, and they weren't that rich yet, right? So that was one thing. He also needed a lot of political financing to stay in power in Malaysia. Najib's father had been a Malaysian prime minister, um, and Najib feared losing power in Malaysia. He would have been the first leader of UMNO, the party there, to lose power since independence from Britain in 1957. Jello senses this, and he says, I can bring you political financing for your, for your, your party, and I can, I can buy jewels for your wife, um, I, can procure, I can procure jewels for her. Right? And a typical sort of bagman, middleman. And he persuades Najib to let him run this sovereign wealth fund called 1MDB. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, that that is the vehicle that they use to go and raise billions of dollars. And then they simply take it using these connections back in the Middle East that I've, I've already described. That's basically how the fraud worked. So he's always, he's always seeing what people wanted, right? And then when he's stolen the money, he's, he's sated. Najib, he's given him his political financing, he's paid for the jewels for his wife, and he sets up, uh, he wants to set up this film company that, he, that um, is headed by Najib's stepson, right? So again, he's, he's, he's sort of uh, paying Najib back by having his stepson. And then he needs to make a, a film, he needs to make a Hollywood film. So he meets, he uses the money that he's stolen to get to meet all these celebrities. Right? He pay, it, there's another a secret of the book that, that people don't know, is that you can pay for almost any Hollywood celebrity to attend a party, however big. Maybe not Leonardo DiCaprio. He was really, at the time, in 2009, I mean, he still is a real A-lister. But again, Jolo senses what did DiCaprio need that he didn't have. Now, that's a lot more difficult than Seat Lin Lin at Wharton or, or Najib, right? You, what would Leonardo DiCaprio need? Well, what needed Leonardo DiCaprio needed was that he wanted to make The Wolf of Wall Street, the film. But, um, uh, and he had bought the rights to The Wolf of Wall Street from Jordan Belfort, the, the real Wolf of Wall Street, for those of you who've seen the film. Um, and then Warner, he got Scorsese on board. Obviously, DiCaprio and Scorsese always make films together. And he had uh, got yeah, um, Warner Brothers to make it. But a few months into the process, and, and Scorsese had already annotated the script, Warner Brothers pulled the plug on the project because if you've seen the film, it's R-rated, it involves a lot of sex, and they thought they would not get a broad enough uh, audience to pay back the investment for the film, which was gonna be $100 million. And Scorsese was furious, DiCaprio was furious, and along comes Jolo, offering $400 million in film financing to DiCaprio and to Scorsese, which is an insane amount. And these guys, who are at the top of their game, Scorsese just won a, an Oscar for The Departed, and DiCaprio was you know, obviously a very famous actor, they suddenly see the holy grail of Hollywood, which is they're gonna get all this money, but they're, gonna get, uh, they're not gonna have to answer to studio bosses, the, the bean counters. And Joel, because Jolo doesn't know anything about films, and nor does Najib's stepson, who sets up the film company. And so they, they, um, they go ahead and make the movies, and they, they allow Scorsese and DiCaprio to do whatever they wanted with the, with the money. So again, Jolo sensed that that was what would get him a seat at the table in the room. And slowly, he's accruing a lot of power by doing this. Um, he's got unlimited funds, and he, you know, he, he knows what people want, basically. Uh, let's go back to Wall Street's role in all of this. Um, as you said, two of the Goldman bankers involved with this have been indicted in the US. But it seems all along the way, um, financial institutions were willing to turn a blind eye to everything he was doing. Can you talk about that? Yeah. yeah, so um, initially, um, he, he starts by, when he first takes the money, he's using banks like Coots, uh, which is now RBS Coots, which is the banker to the Queen of England, and he's using Deutsche Bank, and they're doing it, and he's getting a lot of um, pushback from compliance. 
So he's, there, there are, if you've read the book, you'll see there's a lot of, people go through the motions of compliance at all these banks, but all the money always flows in the end. There's always an excuse for why it has to flow. So Coots would say, you know, or, or uh, Rothschilds, whoever it is, would, would come up with some problem, like why are you moving hundreds of millions of dollars around, and Jola would create an investment agreement, and then it would be okay. Um, after the initial stages of the fraud, he, um, he starts to get sick of having to answer so many compliance questions. He's like, constantly creating documents to allow money to flow, to answer compliance. With. So he, he, he thinks, oh, I've got to find uh, a bank that I can take over, that I literally can be my private, private bank, rather than right, really my private bank. So he, 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 and I'll get to Goldman in a second, but yeah, he, sure. he um, focuses on a bank called BSI. BSI was a Swiss bank um, based in Lugano in the Italian part of Switzerland, and it's business model for years. So another sub-theme of the book is, is private banking as well, as well as Wall Street. For years, its business model had been to be based in the Italian part of Switzerland, and Italians would come across the border literally with suitcases of cash and deposited there and not pay taxes in Italy. By, 2000 and by the late 2000s, that model had been imperiled because the EU was cracking down on it. The US was sick of tax cheats there. And so they were, a lot of the money moved to Singapore. A lot of that European money moved to Singapore, which wasn't cracking down as much, right? It was a newer private wealth center. BSI set up a Singapore office trying to save its business, but it wasn't doing very well because it wasn't as big as Credit Suisse or UBS or any of the other private banks. And again, Joe Lowe, sensing what people wanted, figured that that bank needed, needed saving. Comes along and he says, we will, I'm running this sovereign wealth fund from behind the scenes with the support of the Malaysian prime minister and we will pump billions of dollars through your BSI bank. And he literally took over the bank. He, the bankers there were all working for him. Um, the, the only people to, until today to have gone to jail in this whole scandal are bankers from this bank, BSI. Singapore has jailed them. Um, and so, but he was incredibly successful in taking people there and, you know, touching them and overnight turning them into multimillionaires, you know, putting them on private jets, taking them to see, uh, you know, Mani Pacquiao fight in Vegas or whatever it was. He, he changed their lives. And so he, he was able to, um, there was a compliance department at that bank, but it just didn't do its job. Um, then in, in so he, the, the first frauds were sort of um, stealing money that was raised in Malaysia. Then in 2012, he, he, the financing for the Wolf of Wall Street is, a, the, the filming of the Wolf of Wall Street is about to, to happen. And so he needs to raise bigger, like bigger amounts of money. His ambitions are getting greater. And that's when Goldman comes in. Um, a banker called Tim Leisner, who was a, a Hong Kong-based uh, German partner at Goldman, partner being the, the very senior level of the bank, only 1% of their employees become partner. Partners are very unsupervised at Goldman. They can roam the world and making their deals and getting their cut when they're not, they don't have to be in an office. Um, and Leisner had been uh, trailing Joe Lowe for, for quite a while at that point, trying, knowing that Joe Lowe was sort of running this sovereign wealth fund from behind the scenes and trying to get a piece of the business for Goldman. Right, because it, was, it looked like it would be a very lucrative thing. As I said, sovereign wealth funds are huge now. They raise a lot of money. And um, so when we were writing the book, and, if, and actually in the book, we didn't quite know exactly what Leisner knew about Joe Lowe. And in the book, we play it very, we say, look, it was unclear what Leisner knew. Um, but, the, but indictments that came out just last uh, Thursday from the US Department of Justice paint in shocking detail what Leisner uh, was is still an allegation. But actually, no, he's, ple he's pleaded guilty. So he's in a plea deal with the Department of Justice. He, um, Leisner had a, and another banker called Roger Ung at Goldman conspired with Joe Lowe, and in Roger Ung's case, it's an allegation. You know, Leisner has admitted to it, to um, work with him to raise this money, Goldman would raise the money by selling bonds on the international market. It was a very good time to do so because interest rates were very low and, and the US uh, markets were doing very poorly after the global financial crisis. So investors were very happy to lend money to this Malaysian fund. And then the money uh, was immediately siphoned off using, uh, in a very complex deals, but using in 
conjunction with these co-conspirators in the Middle East. But the indictments that came out last week say that Leisner was involved in this and that he took, uh, it alleged, they alleged that he took $200 million into his personal bank accounts, right? So this is incredible. This is a Goldman banker. This is, don't forget, Goldman is Wall Street's most powerful financial institution, right? Hank Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, came from Goldman. As you mentioned, comes from Gold, the current Treasury Secretary comes from Goldman. Gary Cohen, who was Trump's economic advisor for a year, was at Goldman at the time of all of this, and he was the president of Goldman. And Gary Cohen was very supportive of this business. Now, what Goldman's saying today is that, look, Leisner, the guy who conspired with, with uh, Jolo, was rogue. Okay, that this was happening. Um, now, that, that may very well be, but even if that's the case, at the very top levels of Goldman, Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO, Gary Cohen, the president, missed incredible, incredibly obvious red flags in, the, in allowing this business to go ahead. Um, one of the red flags was the involvement of Jolo. Jolo, when he, when he, he was 27 years old when he first started running 1MDB from behind the scenes, and he had no formal role at the fund, right? So why, and there was a lot of questions on these compliance committees that it's very, after the global financial crisis, which was very bad for Goldman's reputation because of the subprime, the whole subprime mess, everyone, all the banks did a mea culpa, they paid all these big fines to the, to the American government and they promised to clean up their compliance. Um, what, what, what Billion Dollar Whale shows is that it, it, it has not worked Right, that this problem, the subprime crisis, simply just moved to this other problem, which is this sovereign wealth emerging markets crisis, and that Goldman was willing to uh, raise huge amounts of money for a sovereign wealth fund, which this business model didn't make any sense. It was run by a 27-year-old from behind the scenes. At one point, one M Goldman raised three billion dollars for One MDB, and One MDB asks for it to be put into that Swiss bank account I've just been telling you about, that Swiss bank that Jolo took over. And Goldman's lawyer on the deal, Linklater's, says, are you sure you want to be depositing money you've raised for a sovereign wealth fund into a Swiss bank account, $3 billion? That Swiss bank BSI had deposits of around $6 billion in total in the whole world, and $3 billion comes in in one transaction. Huge red flags that never should have, um, that should have stopped Goldman from doing this business. Why, and again, to your question, why did the business not get stopped? Goldman made huge amounts of money interacting with 1MDB. They charged 10% of the bond's face value. So in layman's terms, if, you, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a bank and you're a government, you ask me to raise money norm, for you, normally I'd make about a million dollars. Goldman in total here made $600 million because it was, it, it was done quickly and secretively, right? And it became, Malaysia became one of Goldman's biggest uh, profit centers anywhere in the world which is, for anyone who knows Malaysia, it's ridiculous. It's a small economy. And, and so, um, you know, that, that we've just talked about Swiss banks. We've talked about Wall Street banks. There are many other kinds of banks that were involved, smaller banks, European banks. The auditors that were involved that, that signed off on 1MDB's accounts, they didn't ever really question what was going on, even though the accounts were a joke, mainly because everybody wanted a bit of this business. Everyone was getting rich. Right, uh, Leisner, the partner who, who's now, um, whose sentencing will happen early next year, he was one of the top paid people in Goldman anywhere in the world. He made, he made uh, I think, almost $20 million in 2012. This is not including the money that he allegedly stole, right? This is like the, just his pay and bonuses just for doing business in Malaysia. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible indictment of Wall Street. Yeah. Shoot first, ask questions later. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so how did you recreate some of the scenes, like the most vivid scenes in the book, particularly the parties? Um, what were your sources? So, the source, so the, from, the, from the journalistic point of view? Yeah. So this story stayed out of the media until uh, early 2015. When, so the, the first fraud, um, the, before Goldman came on the scene, the first fraud involved um, a, a deal between 1MDB, the fund that Jolo ran, and a, and a Saudi company, which was co-owned by a Saudi prince. There was an employee at that firm 
who didn't think he had gotten enough pay and knew something about, knew something wasn't right. And when he left, he acquired a copy of that company's uh, email servers. Um, and that, those email servers were leaked to um, the Sarawak Report, which is a, uh, an investigative website with a focus on Malaysia, and The Edge, which is a Malaysian newspaper. And in February of 2015, those two entities re uh, released this bombshell report about Jolo receiving money because the emails of this Saudi company showed some of the uh, money trail of what had happened at the, the early stages of the fraud in 2009. And so it, it came out into the open. We, we subsequently got involved in the summer of 2015, and we, we then focused more on the other parts of the fraud, which are the Goldman parts, which involved Abu Dhabi. So it was Malaysia and Saudi and Malaysia and Abu Dhabi. Um, I think this is the last major uh, journalistic endeavor that's going to be based so much on stolen emails. Because today, fraudsters the world over know don't rely on emails. They're easily hacked, and they're a treasure trove of information for journalists. Um, so these were the, this is just one hacking that we relied on, those emails from Petro Saudi. There was also, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned Ambassador Otaiba earlier, who is still the uh, UAE ambassador to Washington. Um, we didn't, at the beginning of the book, when we were sitting here writing it, we had a problem. We, we wanted to show how did Jolo go from Wharton grad to sort of trusted by Najib to run a sovereign wealth fund. And we didn't have that. I mentioned at the very beginning this, that Otaiba was his enabler. And we didn't have that. So Otaiba, luckily for us, Otaiba was, in 2017, the, uh, one of the, you remember the blockade of Qatar? Um, he was one of the big uh, diplomatic supporters of the blockade. You know, they hate, he's very close to Saudi and he hates, you may have seen his name in the media recently behind the death of, um, Kash, how do you pronounce it, Khashoggi? Yeah, I mean, he's been criticized at Tiber because he's so pro-Saudi, but very anti-Qatar and, and behind the blockade. We think the Qataris hacked Otaiba's emails. And my co-author, Bradley Hope, had lived for years in Abu Dhabi and was a Middle East expert. And he got leaked these uh, emails, Otaiba's emails, from a group, probably a Qatari group, but we don't know who it came from. And luckily for us, in those emails were all the details of Otaiba's interactions with Jolo, which had nothing to do with Qatar. And we were able to show exactly how Otaiba and, and uh, Jolo interacted in the early phases of Jolo's career. So it was a very important uh, reporting resource for us. Um, we also got hold, I told you Jolo set up a film company with the stolen money. We also got hold, hold of the emails uh, of Red Granite, the film company. The emails, we're talking about the whole service here. You get all the contacts, and somebody gave us that. And the, the emails of Red Granite had, this is, this, is, uh, this is what I was doing when I, when I was seeing you for lunch, right? I was sitting there, um, had the address book of, of one of the producers of the, of, the, of the film company in which it had the emails and phone numbers of all, all the Hollywood stars, from Leonardo DiCaprio's cell phone number to you know, Benicio Del Toro's cell phone number. And it also had the cell phone numbers of, of scores of Playboy Playmates. And so we're like, why are there so many Playboy Playmates in these email servers? Uh, so we just started calling, cold calling, sitting in, in, in Elliott Hall, cold calling all these, um, <laughs> these Playboy Playmates in, in Los Angeles going, Hi, this is Tom Ryan writing the book. Um, I've seen your phone number. Do you know Joe, Joe Lowe? And, and, then, and then we got this one woman who's quoted in the book in, in a chapter called An Evening with the Playmates, who said, oh yeah, I know Joe Lowe. Yeah, I, had, I was at a crazy party with him and Leonardo DiCaprio, and there were 22 of us Playmates, and it was only Leonardo DiCaprio and this guy Joe Lowe. I'm like, yeah, go on. <laughs> so, so that was, that was the kind, that's the kind of way, you know, you start with getting access to, and then it's a lot of, I um, mean, you know, it's cold calling, right? There's been a lot of cold calling, and we were able to build scenes up, and then you have to, the sources have to um, be willing to talk to you multiple times, because you need to create a cinematic, versus a newspaper story, you need to be able to create a cinematic sort of uh, amount of detail, right? So luckily, this Playboy Playmate um, who talked to us, had quite a good memory. She was like, oh yeah, there were chocolates on the right-hand side when I walked in, and you know, there was a barbecue food by the pool, and she remembered the sweet and everything. 
So that was the kind of way that we built up the, the scenes in the book. Great. Um, and can you tell us about Malaysian source, your mystery, oh, yeah. um, unnamed source in the book, as yeah, much as so, you can? Yes, yeah, so, you know, so you know, emails were a big, a big part of it. Normal shoe leather reporting, so just calling up. We, we talked to over 100 people. Um, then when the investigations got going after, after you know, the reports in the media, we talked to, we talked to them. But we also, we also developed a, a, a character that we call Malaysian Source in the book. And Malaysian Source was at the heart of the fraud, was somebody involved in the fraud. Um, we call the person Malaysian Source because the person talked to us on an off-the-record basis. So, you know, for those of you who aren't journalists, that means that you... Um, we, had, we had a means you don't quote their name, but you could use the material. Um, we had a long, big debate, Bradley and I, about whether to name this person in the book because I don't know what you think, but like if someone's lied to you as a journalist from start to finish, um, then the terms of your interaction with them may not be valid anymore. It's a great. It's a. I think I don't think there's an answer to that, right? But so I I wanted to just name the person in the book, and Bradley didn't want to, so we didn't in the end, and so we we, we use this mysterious sort of moniker for the person. Um, but the person also tried to get me arrested when I was reporting in Malaysia, um, in, but couching it as uh, being our friend. So Malaysia source called up Bradley and said, I know Tom Wright's in the Shangri-La in Kuala Lumpur um, reporting on this, and the prime minister's office is thinking of arresting him, so you really should get out of, of town. But what we subsequently learned was he was the one agitating for us to, for me to be arrested because we were getting far too close to the, the truth, right, with what was going on. Um, and, you know, again, in journalism, sometimes sources who are adversarial can actually be very useful to you because Malaysian source ended up giving us a lot of information that was very useful for the book, which Malaysian source thought was helping Malaysian source, right? So, for example, uh, Malaysian source gave us min the minutes of 1MDB. Um, which were very useful for, for, for showing what had gone on, the deliberations at the fund. Um, yeah. What was their um, motivation for talking to you initially? Did you find them and say we're going to... Malaysian source? Yeah. I think it was just to try to get us to stop reporting on it. Okay. Yeah, they're like, so they're, yeah. Nothing to see here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Here's yeah. all the information. It's yeah. very boring. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there aren't that many heroes in this book. Um, two of them are your fellow journalists at The Edge and Sarawak Report. Um, can you talk about your relationship with those two outlets and what it was like, I guess, having three publications of varying yeah. levels working on the same story at the same time? Yeah, I think you're right. There's no, like, one thing you'll get from reading this is there's really no, there's very few heroes in all of this, right? Um, there's what, there is one guy who was on the board of one MDB who is a, a senior businessman at Saim Darby, a big, a big uh, conglomerate in Malaysia who resigned from the board because he's like, well, this is nonsense. So there are a few characters, but again, didn't make a big noise about it, didn't want his career to be derailed in Malaysia. Um, but the, yes, the journalists do come out of it very well in the sense that, you know, The Edge, for example, um, uh, K-Tat, Ho K-Tat of The Edge, who was the publisher of The Edge, was arrested. So when, when um, the Sarawak report and The Edge broke these stories, and these are the first stories about Jolo and all of this that we're talking about, um, Najib reacted um, in a very aggressive way, right? And then, then there were the stories about Najib taking 681 million into his own accounts in the summer, which we broke and the Sarawak report broke. Um, he reacted in a very reactionary way. And another, another theme of the book is uh, basically how uh, fragile democracies can be in places without a, a long tradition of, of rule of law, right? And Najib took a, a series of actions to try to uh, stop investigations into this. He fired his attorney general. He fired cabinet members who were questioning it. He, and then with KTAT of The Edge, he suspended the newspaper's publishing license. And he, and he actually had a, uh, KTAT arrested and held overnight. So, you know, I don't, I don't think Najib was, it wasn't sort of the most brutal dictatorship in the world, and therefore not that effective. Um, because people could, it's sort of like authoritarianism light, right? He, he continued to allow some element of, um, of reporting, and the Edge continued to do that. And the Sarawak Report, I think Claire Rucastle-Brown, who runs the Sarawak Report, was 
uh, followed in London and threatened, and she continued to, to report it. Um, and so, yeah, those, the, those are really the heroes of the, of the book, because without them, um, none of this would have come to light. And it makes you wonder how many of these kind of things are going on on a daily basis, right? You know, I mean, you know, there are, there's HNA in China and others, and you just don't, you know, you wonder what, what, and you know, everyone, and again, enabled by Western financial institutions, which will raise money and advise and be involved without, without doing proper due diligence. So Jolo is allegedly in China right now, and he also attempted to stop the publication of the book. Can you tell us what's the afterward? Um, so, right, so like if you look at all the, the characters in this, um, the, the, the bankers in Singapore have been arrested, uh, Leisner at Goldman Sachs is, 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 is pleaded guilty. Najib, of course, uh, lost power in elections in May in Malaysia that shocked everyone, including us, because we had to rewrite the end of the book in a, in a hurry <laughs> when I was in Bali on holiday. I thought I'd finished it. Um, this book will be like, this is a book that will never, never end, right? Um, and, then, and then, so yeah, Jolo is the, in some way, I mean, the, the trials of all of this have to still happen, right? A, this is going to take years to unravel, right, from the, the Goldman case that will start in, next, in the new year to Najib's case in Malaysia. Najib has been arrested in Malaysia, and his case will start in the new year. But the big sort of question mark is, well, where's Jolo, right? Um, so, and this is a really interesting thing for, for all of you guys living and working in Hong Kong, or studying in Hong Kong. Jolo actually was able to live in Hong Kong in the uh, Pacific Place apartments, uh, if you know where they are, near the, uh, above the Conrad or the, the Shangri-La. And we know this because we, for a while we sort of knew, we had sources, we knew where he was operating. Uh, we knew his daily operate sort of uh, life um, for, for a specific period. And we, at that time, there was an Interpol red notice for his arrest from Singapore. There was an Interpol red notice for his arrest from Malaysia after the new government came to power. But the Singapore police, who were fully aware of where he was, right, and you can imagine why, um, didn't do anything about it. They had no interest in arresting him. And uh, the, the, the question is, why? Um, Jolo today, the Malaysian government believes, is living in China. Um, it's, he's obviously a master networker, right? At Wharton, he got to know these, these Arab kids. He got to know Taiba, the ambassador. He got to know Najib and his wife, Rosma, who has, who has found, you know, when they, they found all these handbags and, and watches and, in, in her apartments. And then when, when, his, when you, know, you or I would just lie down and give up and, okay, you've caught me, you know, he, he goes off to China. Najib sort of, before Najib loses the election, sends him to China into exile. And he gets to know all these heads of the state-owned companies in Shanghai and elsewhere. And he, um, Najib is still in power at this stage. And he, he, he's involved in the negotiation of these Belt and Road infrastructure deals in, in Malaysia, which the current Malaysian government believes were padded to take even more money out. And don't forget that they're, they're filling holes of the money that they've stolen, so they need new deals. And so Jolo was sort of involved in those Belt and Road deals that, that Malaysia now says were corrupt and they want to renegotiate. So we are all assuming that Jolo is somehow protected in China because of the, the, his, his role in those Belt and Road deals. And that's why, until today, uh, Beijing has not sent him back to uh, Malaysia, where he's now been charged in absentia to face justice. So it's, a fasc it's also another fascinating element. To the, and very, some of that's in the book, but very little of it, because we, the book was published in September. So it's a very rare nonfiction book where it's playing out in real time, because normally you would write about a sort of historical uh, event, whereas this one is still, you know, the, the paperback, which will come out next fall, will have like all these new elements to it. That, um, oh, and OK, the, 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 he tried to stop the publication of the book. This, to me, is a shocking, shocking element. So obviously, Jolo can't use the global financial system anymore, right? Because finally, compliance has to not allow him to, banks will not move his money. He cannot use the American banking system. Most of his money must be in Yuan and maybe Thai baht, we believe. Um, but when he, he, he has been able to continue to hire some of the, 
uh, most expensive law firms on the planet, including Shillings, which is a, a well-known uh, UK law firm, or I think they call themselves a law consultancy, uh, Carter uh, and um, uh, Cobra and Kim, which is a New York-based law firm. Um, uh, Hachette, who published our book, received scores of legal letters ahead of the publication in September, threatening them, saying, if you publish, you will be uh, li liable for defamation suits. And then, even more shockingly, they sent hundreds of letters to independent bookstores around uh, the world, including Bookazine and many others, saying, if you hold this book, if you stock this book on your shelves, you will be liable to defamation suit. And so we're like, well, how the hell is Jolo paying tens of millions of dollars to these law firms to represent him if his, mo if his money is tied up because he's the, you know, he's been charged in absentia, he's, you know, he's, there's Interpol red notices for him. Well, we learned that one of the ways he was paying it was through a Harrow, Jolo had gone to Harrow before Wharton, has a Harrow school friend of his, a rich Thai guy called Feng Xuan Laomong Nerd, who was his cutout, who was paying his, his fees for him until we named Feng Fian Laomong Nerd in a Wall Street Journal story a few months ago at which point Feng Fian's name pops up on all the compliance lists and you can't use him anymore. But that's, that's how, how porous the world of compliance is because you can always find somebody else to pay for you. And, and I'm, not a, I'm sure there are legal scholars amongst you. I don't really understand this part of it, but I guess everyone's, everyone should have counsel, right, until they are proven guilty. But I don't really understand how the law firms can accept this money from a Thai guy for J Jolo's legal defense when there's all these concerns about Jolo. It seems to me a very gray area um, and a fa fascinating one for, for further study, right? Because, um, you know, the, I mean, it didn't work, right? The, the book is, has been available everywhere. The book, most bookshops, including Bookazine, said we're stocking it anyway. Um, good for them. And, but, in, but the book is still not available in the UK. Um, because the UK has these terrible defamation laws that make it very easy to uh, file a suit. Whereas in America, uh, First Amendment protections are much more robust for, for books of this kind. Um, so it hasn't worked, but um, super, super interesting subplot to the whole thing. Yeah, very. And then my final question before I open it up is, can you tell us about the movie that is possibly coming out about this and what you expect for it? So we, so this book has been the mo like the, I feel like the book gods have really been good to us because first of all, <laughs> the the election meant that you know we've sold a lot of copies in Malaysia, which obviously the book would not have been available in Malaysia under Najib. They, they'd even come up with a fake news law before the elections, which would have you know, targeted this book. Um, we sold yeah I think we sold sixty or seventy thousand copies in, just in Malaysia and Singapore, which is incredible. Um, and then the other, another really lucky thing that happened for us was just as the book came out, Crazy Rich Asians did very well at the cinema. Um, and the, the, uh, the company that made Crazy Rich Asians was looking for a, a, another project. I mean, they, they're gonna be doing the other two Kevin Kwan books, but, and they've got, they got many projects, but they were looking for something else. And this, this book came out and they read it and it really sort of fit their, um, what they were looking to do, which is more Asia, focused stories that aren't like Hollywood. The way that Hollywood has always approached Asia is just to have you know, you know, an Asian character maybe. Whereas the thing about Crazy Rich Asians was it was this ensemble of Asian cast. And so I think they see a billion dollar whale very much in that vein. It's, an, it's, a, it's a story. And it's also, I think they see it as, a, as an interaction between the West and Asia, right? One of the ways that um, the, the Westerners involved in this fraud uh, passed stuff off was to always say, oh, it's just Asia. You know, it's just a, Joe Lo, oh, he's a prince of Asia, you know. Um, or he's a, he's, a, he's a billionaire from Asia and not ask any more questions. That was a very common response to him uh, amongst the people that, that got money from him and, and uh, dealt with him. So they see that, at the, the Crazy Rich Asians, uh, Ivanhoe uh, pictures, sees that as a very uh, sort of interesting topic to explore. So, yeah. Are you worried that he might come off as a bit of a hero like Jordan Belfort in the Wolf of Wall Street? Oh, um, he are seems we, very likable. We should, we should discuss, there's a, great, <laughs> there's a great scene in the book where Jordan oh, yeah. Belfort says, Jordan Belfort is at the launch party for the Wolf of Wall Street in Cannes, 
and he's watching um, Kanye West perform on stage um, for a million dollars, whatever Kanye got paid for that. And he turns to his girlfriend and says, this film company, Red Granite, they've got to be, they've got to be corrupt because nobody would be paying this amount of money for the launch party of a film. So you know, even Jordan Belfort smelled in real time that something was up, was up with all of this. And he, and he, said, he said, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio got sucked in. You know? He was a nice guy, but he got sucked in. Um, no one's saying Leonardo DiCaprio did anything illegal, by the way. Um, uh, but yeah, Jordan, there was the criticism of um, the Wolf of Wall Street film that it glamorized Jordan Belfort's life, right? Some people said that. Um, I, 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 we didn't want to write Billion Dollar Whale as a sort of, um, as a moralistic book. We didn't want to try, to, we tried to sort of not lay the facts out pretty barely. And then at the end, we have some of our own authorial voice coming through about white collar crime. You know, like one of the things I strongly believe is white collar crime has to lead to jail time. You know, the history of white collar crime since the um, savings and loans. So in the savings and loans scandal in the US in the 80s and 90s, a thousand bank executives were indicted. Since then, bankers, white collar crime has not really been uh, uh, punished with jail time. After the financial crisis, the subprime crisis, no bankers went to jail. The New York Times, uh, the, ten, the ten year anniversary, they're on a blank page, and at the top of it, it said, number of bankers who've gone to jail since the financial crisis. So, you know, the, the news last week is that there's gonna be these, in, uh, these indictments in, the, in Goldman's case, and that's gonna be fascinating to follow to see how many people from Goldman are indicted, what happens, you know. Um, so, so you cert certainly, uh, there's a lot more to know about, about how it'll be wrapped up, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah. And now I think the audience probably has some questions. Yeah. We'll start taking some questions. Uh, if you could kindly raise your hand. Uh, Mike will be passed around you by one of my colleagues. And since I have the first mic, I'm gonna ask the first question. Uh, um, Using Goldman Sachs, you're usually working with institutional investors. Were the Malaysian people or the small investors affected? The small investors from? The Malaysian people. I mean, who, 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 yeah, I mean, okay, so one of the problems with white collar crime, is my mic still working? Oh, okay. One of the problems with white collar crime is it, it's this sort of, people often say it's a victimless crime, right? That um, the, the, the Malaysian people, are hugely uh, hurt by this because the bonds that Goldman sold are 10 year bonds and they were sold in 2012 and 2013 and they start coming due in 2022 and 2023 and they are significantly large. Um, you know, I, there's even an argument, I heard this just a couple of days ago, that it could affect um, Malaysia's uh, credit rating. What well, that means, it'll be more expensive for Malaysia to, to raise uh, capital. But I think, you know, the way you've got to look at white collar crime, and it's, it's a bit squidgy, right? Because, you know, if there's a war and you report on it, you can find a victim, you can find a family where a kid's been killed by a bomb, or, right? With white collar crime, it's, it's a bit, <laughs> it, you know, it's hard to personify the victim. But in Malaysia's case, it is a school that didn't get built, or a hospital that didn't get built, or a scholarship that a Malaysian didn't get to do something. Um, it's a sense of inequality that Malaysians have about their elite versus the normal working folk that eats away at the fabric of their society, right? There were these mass protests in Malaysia against the government, the Bursi protests, which, which are born out of that sense of, of inequality. And you know, actually, it almost led uh, to Malaysia tipping to become a authoritarian state, right? Obviously, democracy is in retreat in a lot of places around the world, from you know, Russia to, to wherever. And um, Najib was tilting Malaysia away from uh, being a democratic country in response to this, this fraud. So there's also, there was also that whole political dimension to it. <laughs> Hi, coming from Malaysia. I have the 
just want to pose to you the question, because of this case, right, there are many high-profile murders happen in Malaysia because of this. Aren't you worried at one time that your own safety is being threatened? Um, there's a, so, so we should just say, for those of you who haven't read the book, there is, after the, um, I, I talked about Najib's crackdown, right? And he fired his attorney general, and, and he stopped cooperating with all the other investigations that were going on around the world into 1MDB from the Department of Justice. From, and um, bef just before the crackdown, and the, the main reason for the crackdown, there was an arrest warrant for, for Najib's arrest, that had, a draft arrest warrant that had been signed by a, uh, a public prosecutor. Um, for the money that he had received into his personal accounts from 1MDB. That public prosecutor, a few weeks later, was found dead in a, his body in an oil drum filled with cement and dumped into a swamp. Until today, we don't know exactly, and we play this very straight in the book, because we don't know whether that murder, we know the guy definitely was involved in drawing up the arrest warrant for Najib, and we know he was murdered. He's on the, he, his murder trial is ongoing, and it's unrelated to the Najib arrest warrant. It's to do with another corruption scandal. But there are lots of holes in the, in the case, and the judge will rule on that, and then we'll see whether that's reopened and whether um, they look into that and see. So that's, I'm just explaining for others what you're, what you're referring to. Um, there, are other, there are other murders that people say were related to this case, but I'm including the Ambank founder, which I don't think, I, I don't have any evidence that's actually related. Um, and then in terms of my personal safety, I mean, you're, you're safe until you're not safe, right, as a journalist, <laughs> right? I think you said that. I covered Pakistan for, um, for a couple of years for the Wall Street Journal, where we'd had uh, Daniel Pearl had been beheaded um, when he was a correspondent doing that job. And people, I would always go to meetings in Pakistan and say, I'm from the Wall Street Journal, and they go, oh, Wall Street Journal. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was safe until, you know, it's safe until you're at a roadside bomb or something if you're a, if you're a war journalist, right? Right? You agree with this? I mean, you can't, I'm not going to, like, say it's dangerous until it's dangerous, so I don't know. I mean, the thing, that, the, the thing I think is very, that we've been very careful to do is just to, you know, we're not, we don't threaten anybody. We don't, um, I don't, um, uh, what, what would be the word, um, blackmail anybody ever, right? If you want to talk to me, you talk to me or not, and I'll ask you questions or not, and um, we'll just be very fair. I think that's the best way to, to protect yourself as a journalist. Do okay, we have another question? Uh, on a related topic, maybe you could talk, what's your perspective on the role of the DOJ? As, is it positive or negative? Are they uh, overreaching in investigating crimes that are not committed in the U.S., or is it a positive thing that it helps drive transparency globally? What's your take, having been so intimately involved? It's a great question, and you know why? Because also uh, today, obviously, Jeff's, today or yesterday in the U.S., Jeff Sessions has been fired. Um, <laughs> Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General of the U.S., was um, a supporter of this uh, investigation by the Department of Justice. And, and something we haven't even mentioned yet, which is another just element of this crazy story, Jolo had spent some of his money to hire some very senior lobbyists to try to get the Department of Justice to drop its investigations into 1MDB, including Jolo hired Chris Christie, the former New Jersey <laughs> governor. In fact, Chris Christie is still Jolo's lawyer. I mean, it's just insane. He hired Kasowitz, who's a Trump lawyer, he hired a, guy, a character called Elliot Broidy, who you might have heard about, who was a, who was a Trump associate. He was on the Republican uh, Financing Committee. He allegedly got a Playboy Playmate pregnant and paid her off with the same lawyer that saw, involved Stormy Daniels. So uh, Jolo is, is, has paid off all these characters uh, to try to get the DOJ to drop its case, but it didn't work. Um, now, if you remember, in September of last year, Najib met Trump in the White House stayed in the Trump Hotel, met Trump. And there was a hue and cry about that, because why was he seeing Najib at this time of all these allegations against Najib? So again, that could be to do with the lobbying that Jolo was doing at the time. And now that uh, Sessions has gone, I've got questions about maybe that indictment from the DOJ, the Goldman indictment last week, was, was time to go out quickly before Sessions left. I don't know, something. But more broadly, um, I think America is the only country in the world that cares about 
despite what all the you know, political troubles in America, that has the institutional framework and cares enough about trying to police the global financial system. You know, it, there's been a, there's the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, right? Which means no American company can bribe in a foreign country. It can't act in one way in America and go abroad and act in a, in a different way and pay bribes. There's also something called the Kleptocracy Initiative, the Department of Justice, which is an attempt to stop foreign corrupt people from going to America and buying assets. Now, why do foreign corruptors always go to the US to buy assets? Well, if you've stolen, like if you're Sani Abacha of Nigeria, or Najib in this case, or whomever, or Russian oligarch, if you've stolen a lot of money, you need to go to a place where the apartments cost tens of millions of dollars. And at that time, there were these billionaire towers in Central Park costing $100 million an apartment. That's a cost-effective way of laundering, getting your money. Right? And the kleptocracy initiative at the Department of Justice is trying to stop that. So um, it's not perfect. And people who know a lot about this, we had a meeting in, in Washington about the book um, at the American Enterprise Institute. And all these experts on kleptocracy were saying, well, you know, of which I'm not, you're far too optimistic about the America's role in all of this, that actually it's a drop in the ocean. There's still a lot of corruption. But um, for sure, America's trying to do something, right? They're, try like, and they, they're trying to, to solve this case. And they've, they've frozen all these assets in America that were bought with the, the stolen money. Britain, I, I don't see Britain doing anything. There are, there's a house in Belgravia that Najib, uh, uh, Najib's son bought for you know, 28 million pounds. I don't see the Brits doing anything. Um, Switzerland seems to be a lot slower, too. So America has definitely led, led the case here. Without, without the DOJ, um, I don't know if, if it would have unraveled, right? And now, now they're going after Goldman, right? So do you think Goldman will be held criminally responsible, or should they? So, um, so the question now is, is Tim Leisner, the partner Tim Leisner, who actually became chairman of Southeast Asia, um, is, it has, has, has plea bargained. So he will be sentenced in February, and we'll see whether he gets jail time or not. I mean, he's admitted to these, these crimes. So, but at a corporate um, level. Oh, on a corporate level. So um, on an individual level. And then um, Leisner is helping authorities with their inquiries, right? That's why he, he plea bargained. And so, the, yeah, the question is, is Goldman going to be criminally indicted or not? I would very much doubt so, because, again, since the financial crisis, there are these these uh, deferred prosecution agreements they typically like to use, which is you pay a big fine and then you, but you don't have to admit guilt, something like that. I mean, Bernie Madoff's accounts were at J.P. Morgan, and J.P. Morgan was fined $2 billion for missing all the red flags, not stopping the corruption. So everyone's expecting Goldman to pay the billions of dollars of fines, and they've actually got provisions in their latest financial accounts for that, for paying those fines. <laughs> but the... But the um, the question is going to be, yeah, you, that, your question is the question I don't have an answer to, but is going to be the most important thing. To, is Goldman going to be held criminally liable as a bank? Yes. Finally. Yes. But, I mean, and I don't personally don't think so, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Hi. I'm glad you came for questioning on the behalf of Malaysians. And we want to say thank you very much to you and Bradley for all the work you've done. Thank you. So my question is... Um, so the latest, these two days, right, this news about uh, Lee Sen Long being investigated for an MDB. So do you think that's fake news? I, 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 yeah, I didn't, I saw that. It was in like the Malay Mail or somewhere. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I did read it very quickly and I thought that doesn't seem right. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, I don't, it, I don't see why the Malay, Singapore's prime minister would be involved with the scandal. Um, that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, I, and actually I don't have any information on that, to be honest. Um, in terms of saying thank you to me for Malaysia, on behalf of Malaysians, I, I didn't do it for Malaysians. I did it for like personal glory and then <laughs> and, and, and a good story in the newspaper. Right? We're, no, we're not journalists are not motivated by like doing. I, I, I mean, on a more serious level, like we, it's good that it's not like that, right? Because if you if you become an advocate for something, you know, then you cannot do your job properly. You have to be quite dispassionate and um, and you're motivated by doing stories that people are going to read because they're interesting, right? Yeah. 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 
And, and, and I don't, you know, we were, I faced accusations that we were Mahathir stooges for a, for a long time, including by a guy who worked for Brunswick, the PR company, um, who was working for 1MDB, right? Um, and, the, you know, I, the best way to sort of not get, I mean, Malaysia is a very political place. Everyone's sort of kind of attacking each other all the time, right? Like, like a lot of places, like the US at the moment. It's just not to be, not to be involved in that, right? Same thing with the American, the debate about how you should cover the American political thing, right? You no, know, Jake, uh, not Jake Tapper, the Acosta. Acosta's just filmed himself giving his pass back, right? And there's this whole debate about whether you should be a character in a, in a, should you be a character as a journalist in a big debate that's going on, or should you just be dry and, and I personally believe that you should just find the facts and that they're much more powerful without you being in it so much yourself, right, as a character. See what I mean? Yeah. Thank you very much. I have a question. Uh, uh, some of the Malaysia famous businessmen uh, has been somehow implicated in this one MDB. Uh, for example, I think Mananda Krishnan, Lingote, all has been uh, named. Can you comment on what kind of role they have been playing? And you believe they have been playing active role or passive roles? Any personal gain have been involved? I think that uh, Ananda Krishnan, so for anyone who doesn't know, Ananda Krishnan is a billionaire, one of Malaysia's biggest businessmen. And one of the, it's so hard to talk about this scandal because there are so many different um, parts of it. But one of the ways in which they extracted money for themselves was for the fund, 1MDB, to buy some power plants. We didn't actually talk about what 1MDB was supposed to do. It was, it was supposed to um, improve the, Malaysia's economy by getting into new industries. They just didn't do that. It was, the whole thing was just a sham. But one thing it did do is it bought these coal-fired power plants, which were hardly a new industry. And they bought them from Ananda Krishnan, uh, who he just mentioned. And they overpaid for them. Um, and in return, Ananda Krishnan made, a, made uh, donations to a charity arm of 1MDB, which was used as a slush, part of the slush fund for Najib in the elections. That's a, that, that mechanism is a, very, is a very typical mechanism in Southeast Asia or, or in Asia in general to fund politics, right? Because it's very hard to prove someone overpays for something, and then it's very hard to prove that the charity donation over here is related to that overpayment, right? But that's actually how that worked in that case. And uh, Tim Leisner at Goldman brought that deal. I think the indictments actually state this, that Leisner brought that deal to 1MDB because he was very close to Ananda Krishnan because Goldman had done IPOs for other, other of Ananda Krishnan's companies in the past. So that's the, that's the kind of way that they are. Uh, and Gent, you mentioned Genting as well, the Genting family. They're also involved in that, in that kind of way. But um, I'm not sure whether that's something they're investigating in Malaysia or not. Because frankly, that's the way, that's the way that political funding has worked in Malaysia for a long time. Um, it's not that egregious. <laughs> financial industry. And given what happened after the global financial crisis, has your book mentioned who's, who are the auditors of 1MDB? Who are the because, auditors? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, whole, there's a whole section. It was, it, it, well, there, there are four big auditors, right? Yeah. Um, and you need them to, you need them to, are there five now? Four. Four. Some people include like an, one more. But anyway, there's four big auditors. And you need them to audit your, your books, right? If you're a publicly traded company or, a, or a, not even if you're a publicly traded company, if you're a, if you're a government company, right? Um, and 1MDB ran through three of them. They kept leaving or getting fired because they wouldn't, do, they wouldn't sign off on what they, they wanted. The only, the only one that didn't do 1MDB books was PwC. But Ernst and Young, well, actually, Ernst and Young were the first, and they left without, I think they left without signing off on an account because it smelled bad to them. Then KPMG came on, and then Deloitte Touche. Uh, Deloitte Touche was the funniest, because, not funny, was the weirdest, because their head of Malaysia um, went to a board meeting of 1MDB and said, look, we're going to do your, your accounts. And we've, got, we've received all these letters about fraud at our office at 1MDB. This is very late on. We've received all these letters about fraud, but we don't find any examples of fraud. We can't find any examples of fraud. And um, by the way, would we also be hired to do your IPO? <laughs> you know? and, and then he says, um, oh, and we can help you with your PR. With, with all these three 
audit his firm throughout six years before his yeah. has signed off the accounts? Well, I, like I said, Ernst Young didn't ever sign off when they left or were fired before signing off. KPMG, KPMG did sign off on two, I believe. And then, and then Deloitte signed off. And then I was just saying, the guy was offering to deal with the media on their behalf, which is, you know, if you know anything about auditing, it's ridiculous because that's not what you do. Um, and Deloitte subsequently said, all the accounts we signed off on cannot be uh, counted on anymore, right? So it was, just a, it was just another example of like this, this enabling role of the global financial system. And the problem with auditors is they're paid by the companies that they audit. So it doesn't work. So nothing has changed since well, we 2008. We, we found, we found, no, with exactly. all these compliance new rules for all the banks and all the auditors up and on, nothing has really changed. Again, I'm not an expert on like the evolution of, the, of compliance, but uh, my, my sort of reading that I did about it and the people I talked to, um, that Billion Dollar Whale has touched a nerve because it shows that, no, it hasn't, right? I think maybe if you were, if you were acting in America, um, the, way we, the, the context for this is that after the, after the subprime crisis, there was obviously a lot of new rules in America for banks, right? Volcker. The Volcker Rule, for example. Volcker. Yeah, globally. Well, it's supposed to be globally, but let's, the Volcker Rule stopped banks from using their own money, trading, yeah. proprietary trading, right, to, to reduce risk, the kind of risk that led to the global financial crisis. Um, and in, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, um, Goldman, under Blank, Lloyd Blankfein, had this policy of looking more towards emerging markets. And we, we paint this in the book. This is, they, they actually told people, if you want to make partner, go, go to emerging markets. And I think the reason is that these places were just much less uh, monitored, right? And that the, the sovereign wealth funds that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, you know, that became so powerful, um, were the new ones were all in emerging markets. And so it was just, a, it was a playground to make, in my view, a playground to make more money away from the sort of, the new, the new uh, prying eyes in the US. Because Goldman is a global, and they're global compliance. So it doesn't matter if it happens in Malaysia or New York, it's under Goldman and it's the same compliance. Yes. Across the bank. Yes, 100%, but it doesn't, but I guess, I think one of the problems that's, that is that these, like I said, these partners of Goldman are able to operate pretty freely. Um, you know, in, in the indictment on Thursday, there are multiple, multiple calls that there are these committees, the capital committees, the commitment committees at Goldman in New York, where people are saying, is Jolo involved? Is Jolo involved? And license saying, no, no, no. So like, Goldman, Goldman's position today is, well, we didn't, we, you know, Blank Fine and Gary Coe and the very top level people didn't know, and that, that, that he was a rogue guy. And they probably didn't know everything. But like I said earlier, they missed a lot of red flags. So clearly their compliance department didn't do its job, right? You know, told you about that three billion put into a Swiss bank account, all that kind of stuff. Okay, um, we're gonna take one more question because I know there's a long queue waiting for you to sign books. So we're gonna take this last question and then we're going to close the talk and have you start signing. Hey, um, so. When you read about the plea agreement by Tim Leisner last week, were you surprised to read that $200 million flowed into his accounts, or <laughs> did you kind of hear any rumors while you were uh, investigating this? I was, I was a little bit surprised about the, num the, the, the size of the number. I mean, we structured the book in a way that um, Goldman is very central to this. Without Goldman, this didn't happen, right? And, and Leisner is a major character. We, he's very early on. We, we go into his background. We do all that for a reason. We knew that Leisner was very close to the action. But yeah, I was surprised by the, that 200 million number um, that he took into his accounts. And that's still, you know, that's all, I mean, the, the indictment is, 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 I believe that indictment was just the beginning because I think they were putting pressure on Goldman here, right? And it, we're gonna see more, more and more is gonna come out about what exactly happened. Um, also, Goldman's co-head of investment banking has just been uh, put on leave, a guy called Andrea Vella, who is named as a co-conspirator in that. And he, he, until a few weeks ago, was co-head of investment banking in Hong Kong for Goldman. So now our question is, how, you know, how far up does this go? Um, and you know, some people think it could be an existential crisis for Goldman, right? Goldman had the subprime crisis. It had the Libya, do you remember the Libya, which is in our book? They, 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 they uh, advised Libya, and the Libyan Investment Authority lost a billion dollars, which Vela was involved in. He comes here, and now, now he's been put on leave. So 
this will all play out. And, but yeah, I was, was surprised. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.